Thanks for the kind intro there. It's supposed to be a secret about those space trips. <laughs> so, I'd like to know how many of you read print books. Read what? Excellent. Books wow. in Preaching print. to the choir. How many of you read e-books or have an e-reader? Not many. Okay. And how many of you listen to audiobooks? All right. Great. All wonderful forms. Any kind of reading is great. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about the importance of print media as a way of preserving our culture and to dispel some of the rumors that people don't read anymore. Obviously, this room is, well, you're not an exception, and I'd like to point all that out. And a little bit about the decline of the ebook and what that means for our culture. Uh, as Rich said, I'm your local bookstore owner. I own Space Cowboy. We're also a small press. As he mentioned, I'm an avid reader, avid writer of fiction and poetry. And when I talk about cultural preservation, I mean what is going to last from our generation, from our era, and what we're going to keep alive from previous eras, and what deserves to be kept alive, which in my opinion is just about everything. We all know or have heard about in the 30s the Nazis burning books. It's estimated they burned about 25,000 volumes. Uh, what's not often mentioned is that this was a student protest. The government was there sanctioning it. Joseph Goebbels was there supporting it. Of course, kind of sounds like a plan he hatched, but the people did this to themselves. And it's frightening because in America today, we destroy many more books than that every year and have for decades and decades and decades, whether that's books from the library that are being taken out of circulation and ending up in the dump, or the same thing happening at thrift stores, or throwing away your books. And as a bookstore owner, I feel like one of my duties is to be a preservationist of literature and make sure that books aren't ending up in the dump, because we aren't any better than the Nazis if we let that happen. Some of the authors that were burned in the 30s in the book burnings were Ernest Hemingway, Thomas Mann, Jack London, Helen Keller, a Albert Einstein, Aldous Huxley, H.G. Wells, James Joyce, Victor Hugo, Andre Gide. The list goes on and on and on. Talk about poor taste, right? <laughs> These are things that we should be still reading today, not destroying. And I'd like to quote Ray Bradbury about the importance of this preservation. You don't need to burn books to destroy a culture. You just need to get people to stop reading them. Mm -hmm. So let's fast forward a couple thousand years into the future. Our civilization is gone as many civilizations from the past are gone. We like to think of ourselves as in a place of permanence. And we're not. Technology changes, attitudes change, there are disasters, libraries catch fire. It's happened many times in history. So in a couple thousand years, if someone's doing an excavation and they dig up what we left behind, our mountains of trash and other things, what are they going to find? Now, if they find something like this, what are they going to do with it? I don't know how many of you are familiar with reading or writing code. I studied for about a year, uh, writing mostly in Python and uh, Nyquist, which is a more obscure language, but it is extremely difficult, and if I dug up a cell phone, I wouldn't even know how to turn it on, let alone set up a power source or decipher the code. But if you dig up a print book, there's some hope there. Think about a volume of Voltaire in French and English or a volume of Lorca in Spanish and English, all of a sudden you have the Rosetta Stone, and you can decipher what we were talking about today and before. So we're at risk of losing these things without print media. There's nothing wrong intrinsically with the e-book, but what are you going to do with it in the future? So there's a Norse myth of Odin inventing runes, the first language. And when he invented runes, the idea was to be able to speak to those yet born. So in a sense, when you write, a book is a form of time travel, a way for us to communicate with people thousands and thousands of years into the future, just the way writers from thousands of years ago can still communicate with us today. I don't know how many of you have read the Epic of Gilgamesh, 
but it's an amazing book, and when you read it, you see how many other books have taken from it, how this is an important part of our cultural story. And th this book was written on clay tablets, so a very different type of tablet <laughs> that's going to last a lot longer. So it's our obligation to the future to keep print books alive, to save them. I, I often repair old books, and I'm trying to learn to repair antiquarian books because these are treasures that will not last the test of time if they're not taken care of and preserved. The breadth of the importance of that, we often don't think about the fact that there is a person behind every book, that that was a woman or a man that wrote that for posterity to speak to those yet born. I was reading a book on my lunch break at work a couple years ago, and a young man that I was friends with said to me, why do you read books to get information when you can get it on Twitter one sentence at a time? Think about how many hundreds of thousands of sentences fit into one book, and how many ideas that is that can fit into one place, just from one person. I feel really fortunate that every day I sit in a room filled with thousands of books, and in a little dinky 300 square foot bookshop, I get to hang out with a couple thousand people every day. And that's a, a really wonderful thing, and that is just a small little fraction of what's been written and published. So. When I talk about the importance of preserving ideas, I don't just mean the good ones. I mean the bad ideas need to stay around, too. Uh, in Germany, they, have, they don't ban books anymore after all the burnings, which is wonderful. There is one banned book, though, which is Hitler's Mein Kampf. I would argue that that shouldn't be banned either. And the reason is those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. The bad ideas are just as important as the good ones. And I spoke to a young person a couple months ago who was saying that uh, I shouldn't feel that way, that I shouldn't carry books that have been ba banned, that have horrible ideas in them written by terrible people, because people aren't educated enough to make those decisions for themselves. But if we ban books and burn and destroy books, how will people ever be educated enough to understand and come to their own conclusions? And who decides? Because this has happened before, and this is when 25,000 books get destroyed in an evening, when that attitude is taken. So all of this sounds a little bleak right now, but uh, I think there's a tremendous amount of hope. Most of you read, and I think it's propaganda and a rumor that the print book is dead and that people don't read anymore. And there's a couple reasons that I feel this way. One, I sell books every day, and that's how I make my living. So I have tangible proof right in front of me. Um, but it's more than just that. Contemporary literature. A lot of you have written books, and I carry them in my store. And we have an extensive local section. I sold over $2,000 worth of just local literature last year alone. That's just for 2017. Something like that gives me a tremendous amount of hope. Also, ebooks are in decline and print books are on the rise. In a CNN article from last year, it was stated that ebook sales are down 20%, and this is a continuing trend that's been going on for six or seven years. So the print book is very much alive. I also believe that if there's a really negative stereotype about the youth of today that they don't read, that they're just glued to their devices. And I know this to not be true because we do a program at our bookstore where we give free books to any kid that comes in. I gave away hundreds of books last year to kids. And every time I mention to a child, hey, we have a section of free books, please pick out anything you like, it's met with incredible <coughs> enthusiasm. One, they're excited to be spoken to as an adult. Two, you never get anything free anywhere, right? <laughs> and. A lot of them, vacationing kids, their parents will tell me, we brought a stack of books and they read a book a day and they've gone through all of it, so we need more. And oftentimes vacationing families will come back two, three, four times to exchange and get new books. So the kids are really getting a bad rap. They're enthusiastic. And when it comes to really young children that aren't ready for chapter books and things like that, 
they're almost even more excited. They still pick out a book and they ask their parents, can we have story time tonight? So to me, this is a victory on two fronts. One, young kids are eager to get into storytelling and reading. And two, the families are going to spend time together that night reading. So it's a complete success. Mm -hmm. Another thing that indicates to me that the print book is very much alive and that people are still reading is that we're really fortunate in our community. We have four wonderful used bookstores. Most big cities can't claim that. And I've talked to some of my customers that say, oh, our local Barnes & Noble went out of business and I'm going out to other big box places, whatever. But it was our only local bookseller. And now we have no bookshops. So I think in our community we need to congratulate ourselves to have that many bookshops that are in business and have been for a long time. We must read a lot as a people here. And we are very lucky that that is the case. The big box stores I brought up briefly, and while well, there's nothing wrong with them, even though they're my competitor, um, I think that there's an important distinction between the independent bookshop and the big box store in what they're doing and what that means for the preservation of literature. In the big box stores, you tend to get pop titles. You know, you will find Fahrenheit 451, for instance, by Ray Bradbury, but are you going to find all of his books? where the independent bookseller tends to have a focus and taste, a, a curation, where I'm a big Bradbury fan, for instance, I try to have as much of it as possible, where you can get deeper than just the hit titles, than the best sellers. Which brings me to the internet. Oh, sorry, before I go into the internet, I want to point out that uh, according to Statista.com, in the United States, and this is a reassuring statistic, we have 2,321 independent bookstores. And where this is really good, that's not including the big box places. There are much less of them. Uh, that's very reassuring because that's a 20% rise since 2009. So while they tell us over and over again, people aren't reading, no one reads anymore, why would we have such growth in the independent bookstore market? And I think that the reason why is because you know, while Amazon is obviously a very big bookseller and a lot of people have turned to buying their books online, there's something I like to call expertise versus algorithm. When you buy a book online, it will make suggestions to you based on your history versus other people's history who have bought similar books. If you came into my bookshop and I did that, you wouldn't leave with something you wanted. You would, well, you'd be getting a, a generic description. You like this, you like that. And reading is much more personal than that for people. Uh, we don't all like the same books. We might have the love of one author, and, and you might hate the next author I love. So there is a very personal experience with the independent bookstore. Uh, one, they tend to be better read than algorithms. And, uh, and also, you get to know somebody, so you can make an accurate suggestion, not based on a history of purchases, but by a facial expression, let's say, or the reaction to a book that's been found on the shelf that they've been looking for for a long time. So it's this personalized touch, the interpersonal communication, and the ability to have real discovery that involves a community versus just a screen and clicks and a machine software that's making decisions that don't have anything to do with humanity. So I think it's our responsibility and an independent bookseller's responsibility to preserve culture by keeping print books alive. If we keep them in good shape, they'll last thousands of years, hundreds of years, and they can be there for the future uh, so that we don't forget what we were all about, so they don't forget what we were doing today, and so that we don't forget what happened before us, because it's super important and we're just going to repeat the same mistakes if we don't allow for a cultural memory. So I hope today that you've learned about the tremendous importance of independent books, uh, bookstores, and print books, and how the ebook does not have longevity built into it, just by nature. And I'd like to know how many of you are going to keep reading. Thank you. <laughs>